The reason why we're teaching these series, we last month we did squad goals, it matters who you do life with, and now we're talking about more intimate relationships, is because whenever the adversary uh, wants to gain access to your life, he normally, do, he normally does it via some type of relationship. Whether it's a familial relationship, intimate relationship, a friendship, there is, you have to be very mindful and aware of the people you connect with. And so a lot of us, we make decisions based on whatever in that moment or that season that has intoxicated us. The scripture tells us, and we're going to get to the scripture, it tells us to be sober and to be vigilant. And it tells us why we need to be sober and vigilant. It tells us to be sober and vigilant because there is a very real enemy that walks around seeking whom he may devour. And so we have to make sure that our mind, that we are not drunken on emotion. Some of us, we make really bad decisions when we're super emotional. Do I have one witness? Sometimes we are intoxicated by the need for validation. And when you're intoxicated for the need of validation, you tend to go get validation in the wrong places. Have you ever heard somebody say, you're looking for love in all the wrong places, which should infer that there is a right place for love, there is a right place for validation. But when you're intoxicated, when you are moved or dictated by your emotion or whatever that desire is, you're not able to think clearly. Now, I know this is real carnal. Has anybody in here seen the movie Hangover? I ain't judging you today. Next week, I might judge you. I'm just joking. In one of the images or one of the scenes of this movie, a man, he doesn't remember what happened the night before, but he woke up married to somebody he did not know. And he woke up with a massive hangover. He couldn't remember what happened the night before. He had memory loss. He was, uh, had a headache, and he was sick. And I said that to say, it seems like a lot of our lives seem to mirror or mimic that feeling of having a constant hangover. Our decisions, our relationships, the people we connect with, the people we are intimate with, once we come out of that moment, we, we come to ourselves and say, what did I just do? How did I end up where I am right now? We believe, like everything else, we should be led and guided by the Holy Spirit in the area of our relationships. You think I married her because she's beautiful? Even though she is beautiful. Isn't she beautiful? Do you think I married her because of just what she does? She's, a, she's brilliant. She's intelligent. She's educated. No, I had to be very prayerful and mindful that whoever I connect with, they, we have to have similar destinies. We have to have the same language, and we have to be going in the same direction. Some of us have made relational decisions based on where we are right now instead of based on where God is getting ready to take us. You cannot make a permanent decision based on a temporary situation. And so, over the next few weeks, and on the last Sunday, we have a surprise for you guys. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about sobriety and being led by the Spirit as it pertains to decisions on sex, relationships, and love. I want you to turn with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. And let's start at the 27th verse. It reads like this. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Doesn't that seem drastic? I'm like, dang, does that still apply to us today? <laughs> For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I know that sounds like a very extreme um, direction from the Lord Jesus. This was Jesus talking to a group of people. He was giving direction and he was speaking specifically about lust. And, and we know that it seems extreme, but the reason why it seems so extreme is because we know that lust is something that overtakes you. Lust has no stopping point. 
Lust has no limits. Lust does not know when to stop. Lust will continue to take and it is never fulfilled. It, it, it will continue to take and it is never fulfilled. And Jesus is saying that it is so important that you guard your heart. It is so important that you guard your body. It is so important that you guard your life that if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, do you think when Jesus was talking, somebody just took something and just gouged their eye out? He's saying, no, I want you to be very protective and very, very, very particular about the things you set your eyes on. In the book of Job, the 29th chapter, Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes that I won't look on any woman lustfully. There are various places of our lives that we have to protect. There are various gates. We have to protect our eye gate. What we look at, we have to protect our ear gate, what we hear, and our mouth gate, what we say. And I believe what we say is a direct response of what we see and what we hear. And whatever you put your eyes on or set your meta, what you meditate on, it begins to take root in your heart. Does, do I have a witness? Yeah. I have a, a testimony, and I need you all to pray for me. And, 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 and I'm not going to watch it at all this week. But somebody in my family told me about this horrible show. It's on Netflix. And I was looking for the redemption in the show. It's called Shameless. And I watched a few episodes. <laughs> and that show, I, every time I watch it, I'm like, where's the redemption? Where's the freedom? Like, is there, is, there a, a, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? But this show is about a very dysfunctional family who actually, who, 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 they're very intoxicated. There's no limits. There's no boundaries, and it's the parents are dysfunctional, hence the children are dysfunctional. There's no limits, there's no parameters, there's no boundaries. And so they make their decisions from a very drunken place, from a place of need, from a place of pain, and from a place of, 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 of a, there's a void that they're looking to fill. And we want to make sure as the body of Christ that we don't find ourselves in the place of desperation making decisions that we will ultimately regret. So with lustful intent, this is why Jesus said this. He says, for the purpose of uh, lust begins in the heart, the center of a person's identity and will. It is not enough to maintain physical purity alone, but one must guard against engaging mentally in an act of unfaithfulness. Uh, and Jesus is adding, uh, he's not adding to the Old Testament law, but he's bringing clarity. And so lust does not begin with the physical act, but it begins in the place of your identity, which is your heart. It begins in the place of the heart. So we have to guard our hearts, guard your hearts with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. It is the seat of your emotion, your mind, your will, and your emotion. This is why we have to be very intentional about what we entertain. And so Jesus says you have to guard this, your place of your emotion. Now go with me to 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, we're going to start at the 8th verse. And then I'm going to turn it over to my wife and she's going to do some, she's going to expound on it. It says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Be watchful, be vigilant, be sober minded for your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is why we have to be sober and we have to be vigilant because the enemy is looking for an access point into our lives. He's looking for access, a place to enter, whether it's relational, whether it's emotional, whether it's spiritual. We have to make sure that we are living from a place of sobriety. Somebody say sober, be sober. Sober. That means do not be intoxicated with emotion, do not be intoxicated with desire, but we have to live a very sober life so that we can be able to watch out for our enemy and we can be able to live and function in the place of destiny and purpose. 
Sometimes we allow situations, circumstances, and relationships to liberate our minds. We get overtaken. Say a trial happens and we just get drunk with emotion. We don't know how we're going to make it. We don't know how we're going to get through this. And you begin to be overtaken by your emotions. When you're overtaken in this place, you're not able to make sound in wise decisions. Whatever your vice is, whatever the thing is that trips you up, you find yourself trying to work through it, you find yourself constantly asking God to set you free. Whatever your vice is, you have to be very sober in that area because the enemy is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so, and so we also see this in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. It's a huge correlation. The wife is talking to, to the Lord. She's, she, this is a part of her prayer as she is getting ready to get married. And one thing she says is, catch the foxes for us. It is the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. And so here what she is talking about are these foxes that come and they come to steal. But a lot of times, a lot of times as believers, the Lord shows us those small foxes and we ignore them. Those foxes are temptations. Those foxes are the little things that we might not consider to be sin until it gets us to a place of sin. How many of us, I'm hoping everybody raised their hand, how many of us have been to the dentist? Everybody raise your hand. Even if you haven't, raise your hand. If you have ever had a tooth extracted, what do they do first? They numb you. That is what temptation comes to do. It comes to numb you so that once the extraction happens, once the enemy comes to take from you, you don't feel it. You don't feel it. You don't know it until the numbing is gone. And so that is what she is saying here. She's saying, Lord, show us, catch for us those small things that have the potential to ultimately ruin our relationship, to ruin our marriage. And so temptations come to numb you so that when the fall happens, it doesn't hurt as bad. So a lot of times you hear people making excuses for those those smaller foxes. And there are a lot of things that people think are small foxes, but they're not small foxes. This is why you can talk to someone and they say, man, it's just, it's just porn. At least I'm not having sex. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's just a little bit of this. At least I'm not doing this. Those are the things that we make allowances for, but sin is still sin. Mm -hmm. But what it comes to do is, while you're sitting there and you're watching the porn, while you're sitting there and you're engaging in those things, once you actually fall, it doesn't hurt as bad. Because you've numbed yourself. You begin to numb yourself. The Lord, every time he gives a temptation, in 1 Corinthians he tells us, it is illegal for the enemy to tempt you with something that the Lord has not provided a way of escape for. Wow. So every single time you're, if you're tempted, it's the job of you and the Holy Spirit in partnership with each other to find your way of escape. Amen. But what happens is, you see, a lot of times in the Bible you hear a pattern where it says that someone was given over to the lust of their flesh. Yeah. You see that happen several times. Why would the Lord give someone over to their sin? It's because they continue to ignore the ways of escape that he gave you. And so this is what happens when you're working deliverance with people. You hit a roadblock where you're like, okay, we're not getting anywhere. Typically, that, that person has been handed over to the lust of their flesh. And there are things that they have to do to make that. It's, it's not the job of God to break every single act of bondage. What we have to understand is that we have to actually do things. We have to actually yes. make, we have to make um, ourselves available for the yes. Holy Spirit. Yes. This is why a lot of times people who have had several sexual encounters and they're praying to the Lord, saying, Lord, take this desire away. It doesn't just go away. Because the Lord is saying, at this moment, I've given you so many opportunities. I've given you so many ways of escape, and you ignored them time after time. Now, what I need for you to do is begin to sacrifice. I want to see you in that relationship. That's good. This is what Jesus only, Jesus only confronts lust twice. Two times. They're both in the book of Matthew, and they're both extremities. So that's in the book of Matthew chapter 5 where he says, gouge out your eye, cut off your... Uh, cut. That wasn't Paul, it wasn't Peter, that was Jesus that said that. And what he is saying there is take whatever extreme measures that you need to guard yourself. What does this look like in modern day? This looks like if, I, if, if you're addicted to porn, it looks like maybe saying, maybe I don't need a Wi-Fi plan. Maybe I don't need data. Maybe, maybe I don't need Wi-Fi at my house. No Wi-Fi? No Wi-Fi. <laughs> 
That, 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 would, that is what this would look like in modern day. Nobody go home and gouge out your eyes. That's self-harm. Okay, no, we, don't, we know. Don't do that. But if you're saying, I continue to struggle with this, maybe I need to get a software on my phone and add three of my closest friends so that when I do pull up that website, they get an alert. There are, there are softwares for this. And somebody is making so much money because people are so bound by lust, they're so bound by pornography that somebody created a software. And it is a software that you can put on your phone for accountability. So that, that right there should lift off the condemnation that you're not the only person that's dealt with this. There are enough people in the United States that deal with this to where someone created a software. This, she said something about accountability. Accountability is a measure and a tool that God gives us to help us to be delivered. Accountability brings a sense of sobriety and awareness. When you are accountable, first to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will weigh on your heart. He will say, don't do that, don't go there. And even if you override the Holy Spirit, he, you have to have systems and people around you that will give you wisdom and wise counsel. Be like, man, don't do it, don't go there, I'm here for you. So we have to be able to utilize the system of accountability. The way, what accountability does for us is we know that the enemy is working on his job 24 hours, seven days a week. Our flesh, the Bible says, there's no good thing found in the flesh. Somebody say amen. amen. I know you think you're strong. I know you think you can do anything. But don't tempt your flesh because nine times out of ten you will fail. Yeah. But what accountability does is it puts systems and structures around you to help sober you up. Have you ever been in the moment, in the moment, or the heat of the moment, whatever it may be, and you're not thinking straight, but you had somebody there to put their hands on your shoulder and be like, nah, man, nah, girl, don't, don't do there, don't go there, don't do that. It brings a sense of sobriety. This is why isolation should never be named among us in the kingdom. When people separate themselves, when you uh, separate yourself from the community or the body, what you're saying is, I want to be given over to my passions, or I'm grown enough to do anything I want to do. Wow. Has anybody ever said that I'm grown? Yeah. But you being grown does not, does not take you out of the running from falling. Yeah. Your grownness does not take you out of the place of being able, from making that mistake. So accountability is essential. But what, what Pastor said, the Holy Spirit has to be your first accountability partner. Because the issue is most people are not honest with their, their human, their fleshly accountability partner because the Holy Spirit's not their accountability. And so the Holy Spirit has to give you a conviction to be honest with the person that you are saying holds you accountable. I can tell how mature or how immature someone is by the way that they handle accountability. If I am your accountability partner, if Pastor Ashley is your, I'm asking hard questions. I'm asking very hard. If I, when I see you, I was, what did you do this weekend? Did you sleep with somebody? Like, I'm, I'm asking those questions. And if, you, if you're not desperate enough, you're going to be offended. See, the desperate don't get offended when people ask them those type of questions. The desperate will say, please ask me what you want. No, actually, let me offer it to you. You don't have to ask me nothing. Let me tell you what I did. And so I can only hold someone accountable who's desperate. If you're not desperate, I don't want to hold you accountable. Because nobody has time to be FBI agent. I'm not snooping through your stuff. I don't want to see your phone. I'm not going to say, let me see your phone. Nobody has time to do that. What I need for you is to just say, this is what I did. Or let me ask you and be honest. And understand that in the context of a healthy relationship, a context of healthy church family, it's okay. It's okay. So that is what, that's what you have to understand when we're talking about accountability. In Matthew chapter 5, 28, where Pastor read, um, one, thing, one lesson that we learned here is that purity is not only a matter of where your body goes. Okay. I know some people who are virgins, and they are not pure. Come on, man. Okay, so purity is not a matter of where your body goes. It's also a matter of where your mind takes your heart. All right, I had somebody on Facebook say that I was reaching. Because I said something about music. I gave the 10, I, I said I was celibate for 10 years. That's a part of my testimony. I was celibate for 10 years before Pastor and I got married. And I said that there were 10 things that helped me to stay pure during those, those 10 years. And one of them was I love, love music. I love R&B music. But there was a season of my life where I did not listen to it. Because I had no outlet. 
I said, what, what is the point of me laying up listening to Trey songs? All he talked about is one thing, right? So I'm listening to Trey songs. I'm getting all hot and bothered. And I have no outlet. What is, why continue to put my flesh through what I felt like was torment? Then I had to take a shower and go to bed. And just, and just sit there and say, okay, Lord, we're going to send my husband. Because why continue to put yourself through that? My mind was taking my heart somewhere, and it was creating an imp impurity in my heart. And so that is why you take those extreme measures. For me, that was like the cutting off my hand. That was my, that was my desperate measure of saying, Lord, this is serious to me. And although I'm not saying that the music is what causes people to sin, for me, it was a contributing factor. Because after that, then I'm sitting there and I'm scrolling in my phone looking through who, who I can I text. I'm going to go to movies tonight. Right? And so it's, it's typically one thing after another after another. And so I wanted to catch those small foxes. That was one of my small foxes. Now, when we're talking about men and women, I need you guys to understand this. I love when the Bible lines up with science. Okay? Because there's a lot of times where people can read things in the Bible and say, no, that's not true. Or that's Old Testament. That's New Testament. But one thing, typically, if you can get a scientist and a Christian to agree on something, it almost makes it like, okay, everybody can, can digest that. And so when we're talking about sexual sin, you have to understand you will never leave a sexual encounter with 100% of yourself. It's impossible. Every time you have sex with someone, you leave a deposit. You leave a, you leave a part of yourself with them. Sex is not a single dimensional experience. And that is the issue. Most people think that when you have sex with someone, it's just our bodies. We're just, it's just pleasure. It's a tri-dimensional experience, meaning that it, it has your spirit involved, your soul is involved, and your emotions are involved. Every piece of you is involved in a sexual encounter, whether you like the person or not. Science is backing this up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this. One thing that we have to understand, so when we're, and the reason I want to give you guys this, this kind of, this science behind it is because when you really understand how your body works, when you understand how your mind works, and once you understand your soul, it makes it a lot easier for, what you doing? I, feel like I just got set up. It makes it a lot easier to withhold or withstand that thing. For me, the 10 years, the 10 years of celibacy, that wasn't because I was holier than thou, but that was because I understood the curse because I had had sex outside of marriage before, and I seen the damage that it did to my soul, all right? And I didn't want to experience that anymore. And so because of the understanding that I had of how, how un, I understood how serious this was, it gave me the longevity to withhold. And so men and women are typically, they're driven by two very real needs. We all understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The very first line, the very first need is love, affection, sex, pleasure, okay? These are things that we need food, we need shelter. love, we need shelter, all right? Women are driven by love, most women, and we're talking about, now, now you have to understand, once, once you have undergone so much trauma and heartbreak, some of this stuff gets very confusing, and it, it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. But women are typically driven by love, and men are typically driven by what? Pleasure. pleasure. The, the typical man is driven by pleasure. The typical woman is driven by love, uh, love. So many times both men and women use sex and relationships to fill that need. Men get in relationships sometimes because they want pleasure. Women get in relationships because they want love, they want affection, they want affirmation. And the thing here is in the, in the book, I think, of Romans, Paul uses the word dishonorable passions. Another, one, or another word for it was disordered passion. So what he's saying here is that these passions are real, but they're out of order. We, we, because of sin, these passions have gotten misplaced. And so it's okay to want pleasure, but then it gets disordered, and then you want it before marriage. Or you want it instantly. Or you're driving down, you're down, driving down the street, and then all of a sudden that, that, that lust, that pleasure begins to creep up. And one thing that the church doesn't do well is talk about just the simple fact of hormones. People have hormones. Amen. Okay? And it's not a lust demon. Let me tell you that. It's not, you're not driven by lust. You're not full of lust because you experience hormones. It's what do you do once you experience it. 
And so women have what's called, we have a lot of this hormone called oxytocin. Okay, it's called the love hormone. This is the hormone that is actually released when a woman gives birth. It's the bonding hormone. It's what, it's what, it's what you feel when you have your child. You first see them and you have that rush of hormones. If you've ever delivered, I haven't. Um, but if you have ever had a baby, you know what that feels like when you first see your child. That is the same exact hormone that's released during sex. And the issue with that is you can't dictate how much of it is released, and you can't dic you can't stop it from being released. That's the same hormone that's released in within the context of marriage. Is the same hormone that is released during a one night stand. So the same exact hormone that is released when you are in 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 um, covenant with someone is the same hormone that is released when you are having a one night stand. That is why I say you cannot take 100% of yourself away during a sexual encounter. This is why it's easy to feel the emotion of love after sexual intercourse. This is why you hear people say they love people when they're having sex, they don't love them. It's because their hormones are all over the place and you say, oh my God, I, I just love you. And it's like, no, I don't. After, after you come out of the drunken stage, you're like, I, I was saying all kinds of stuff and I didn't, I didn't mean any of that. It's because of the oxytoxin. It's all, it was all the hormones all over the place. Women produce more of this hormone, but men have the ability to produce it, but it's after they've had sex consistently with the same person. Okay? So after, within the context of marriage, this is why it's beautiful, because you do see men become more vulnerable. They become more, they, 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 because they're able to produce more of this oxytoxin. But men do not produce this just right off the bat. And I'll tell you what they're producing in, in, in a minute. So this is the main reason, or this is the main hormone released when a woman gives birth to her child. Um, this hormone also allows for you to lower your defenses and it allows you to trust more. This is why women can be in a domestic violence relationship, she can be getting beat up, still having sex with someone and making excuses for them. Because there was a level of oxytoxin that was released to where it makes you see things a little bit different. It kind of makes you a little delusional. Oh my God. So you begin to trust, it takes down your defenses. It opens you up for vulnerability. This is why sex is essential in the context of marriage because it opens you up and makes you vulnerable. But that's very dangerous when the person is not worth being vulnerable with. Come on. It also increases your level of empathy. Once again, we're taught if we go back into unhealthy relationships, this is why someone can be getting beat up by someone and still feel bad for them, because you you have you have um, increased your level of empathy for that person. And once again, I said this already, but this hormone cannot identify the difference between a hookup and marriage. So regardless of what kind of context, this is the hormone that's being released. Now, men during sex, they are releasing what's called dopamine. Dopamine is all about pleasure. It's all about happiness. It's, it gets them drunk on that pleasure. But they're not releasing a whole bunch of oxytoxin. And so men desire, men typically desire a solitary affair. This is most of a lot of men, a lot of single men, they can have pleasure by themselves. They don't, they don't need a woman. They don't need an intimate relationship. They don't need the context of love to experience pleasure. They can, they can experience sexual arousal completely independent of a relationship. And many have little need to even have to share that experience because all they're doing sometimes is creating a dopamine release. That's what they're looking for, are those outlets for those dopamine releases. So men are visual. They're visual beings. This is why I don't, I don't care what anybody says. When women decide that they don't want to dress modest in the church, that's an issue because men are visual. And so you can, you can come in here, you know, with, with your cleavage out and want to work the altar and say, it's, it's their job to, you know, deny their flesh, but it's also our job as their sisters to guard them. Okay, because men are wired to be visual. That is why they have an issue. That's why a lot of men do have an issue some point in their life with pornography. Women do too. Women do too, yes. And so if you look at Psalms um, 101, verse 3, and then Matthew 5, 29, you will see that, that in these scriptures, they're talking about guarding your eyes. 
it, it, it always talks about your eyes. Typically, you see when, when, when lust is being addressed in the Bible, it talks about your eyes, then it talks about your mind, and then it talks about your heart. When I see that pattern, it makes me feel, okay, those are three essential things that the Lord is trying to let you know that you need to guard. One thing that we need to understand is that a moment of pleasure can produce decades of soul issues. Come on. A moment of pleasure can produce decades of soul issues. When someone is in sexual sin with someone, when, when you are engaging in sex outside of marriage, it's not just about that moment of pleasure. It's not about that moment of pleasure. That's why you can be sitting there doing a the deliverance session with someone and they're bringing up what happened when they were 12 and 13 and 14. Because it creates decades of soul issues. <clears throat> Sex outside of marriage creates a war within yourself. So in the book of John, when, when Paul is addressing the people, he says, Hey, I hope that you're getting along, that, that you're doing well that in your body, and that your soul is getting along with itself. Wow. That lets you know that your soul within yourself can have can wage war against itself. Mm -hmm. What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So that means that your mind can dictate, your mind can want to do something, your will does something else, your emotions is somewhere else. And what it does is it creates almost this appearance of insanity. Ah. It creates this appearance of insanity. This is why a woman can tell, most women can tell when their daughters are sexually active. Yeah, that's right. Everything changes. They start walking different. They start talking different. That's right. They start snapping back. Like they start doing all this stuff using their hands and they're walking and they and you're just like something's up. Oh, oh, oh. Typically, parents know when their when their children are are starting to engage in sex because they do start things start going off. Like they're they're, they're they start losing their minds. I lived in the house for three years and I always knew when a girl was having sex. I was like, she's losing it. Like she, she done, she's losing it. Straight A's now, they all C's, and now she's tripping, she's sneaking out. And I always knew what was going on. Because when you have sex outside of marriage, that is the consequence. And this is why, this is why, G, this is why the Lord asks us not to have sex outside of marriage. It's not because he wants to punish us. And it's not because he doesn't want us to experience that pleasure. It's because he's saying, I don't want you to have to undergo this war within yourself that's so unnecessary. I didn't create you to have this, this inner war within yourself. Your soul was created to be at peace and to be at one accord with each other. Mm. Your mind should be on the, same, on the same track as your will. Your will should be on the same track as your emotions. But sex outside of marriage, it scatters all that. It confuses it all. And so the Lord is really being more of a protective father when he gives us this law. It's not just a law so that we live and we just have to be celibate and we're just a bunch of nuns and monks and we just can't have fun. It really is more so to say, hey, daughter, son, you're not ready for that consequence. Yeah. Sin is its own consequence. Sin is its own consequence. The Lord doesn't have to give us any consequences because we, we make them for ourselves. And so it creates this war within itself. Everybody has heard James chapter 1 verse 8 where it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Yeah. Another version of that is it says a double-minded also means a double soul or a divided soul. So when you see people who are unstable, it's because they have a divided soul. Everything is off balance. Everything is completely off balance. And a divided soul can never interpret what real love looks like. A divided soul has no understanding of what real love looks like. That is why I can go to someone and I can be their accountability partner and then they start getting offended because they're like, you all up in my business. They have a divided soul. So they don't understand that my interpretation of what, what I'm saying to you is out of love because a divided soul has no ability to interpret what genuine real love looks like. And then it begins to translate lust as love. And so this is why the Lord tells us to be sober-minded and vigilant. There is no way that you can that you can address the sexual sin in your life or any sin with a passive attitude. I'm, I'm I'm an extremist when it comes to my when it comes to my purity. I was an extremist, so I had I, I had myself on a curfew. I would tell people I'm not we not we can go to the movies. I'm you're not coming to my house. I'm not coming to your house. You're not kissing on my neck. Don't don't do all. I was I was an extremist, but it was because I understood. I understood the consequences of that. 
And I understood what Jesus was talking about when he was saying, remove those stumbling blocks. Yeah. Remove them. Why, why continue to put yourself through this torment? Why continue to think that you were, you, you're really thinking more highly of yourself than you are because you think that you can continue to play with fire and not get burned? And so there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, these are the things, these are the areas of my life that I need to cut off. These are the revisions that I need to make to my life so that this is something that I can, I can live for. I, I really believe that one of the things that the enemy is really afraid of are pure Christians, are people who really live a life of purity. And I'm not just talking about sexual purity. I'm talking about purity in heart. Yeah. There's no way to just be sexually pure and then be impure in your heart. Yeah. You have to be holistically pure. Yeah. And it's a continue, and this is something that you just don't arrive at. You don't just wake up and you're just saying, you know what, I'm pure in my heart, and I have sex no more. Like these, these are things that have to be worked through. These are things that have to be worked through. And so, I think that's. While she was talking, one thing that that's been you don't hear this talked about often in church, because usually where there's a bunch of religion, there's a lot of cover ups. Yeah. Wherever you see a, the spirit of religion, especially in the inner city context, you people will shout, shout out their shoes if you tell them their blessing is on the way. But if you tell them they need to discipline themselves in their bodies, they sit down and look at you like you're crazy. And the reason why we have these type of messages and these type of conversations, because if you can get your soul right, everything else will follow. And so we decided instead of tickling your fancy and tickling your ear, we want to tell you, let's discipline our bodies. Yes. Romans 12, 1, the apostle says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies yes. as a living sacrifice. Later on, it says, know ye that your body is a what? Temple, the house of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So we don't want to defile the temple. And the reason why the Apostle Paul, this is nothing new. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was talking about to the church about sexual sin. Because back then, there were a lot of converts who came out of the Greek culture. And the way they worshipped their God was through sexuality. And a lot of that, if that was not addressed, it would seep in to the Christian church. And instead of, uh, um, instead of condemnation and and calling you all kinds of names. No, what we want to tell you is that it's possible for your soul to be whole. It's possible for you to live a healed and whole life. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. It's possible for you to be delivered in the place of your sexuality in your relationships. And when this is the case, wholeness will be your portion. Ephesians, and we're going to close. I love the Ephesians 6 where it talks about the whole armor of God. And this is one thing I had to apply as coming up in the faith, coming up as a young man. It talks about the belt of truth. And it says, put the belt of truth, gird your loins with truth. Because I know the Lord knows that sometimes your passions will lie to you. Some of us have gained, gained our identity based on the passion of our loins. Some of us are directed, we're driven by the areas of our passions or sexuality. He says, so sometimes your passions will lie, so you need to gird it with truth. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Because when you're drunk, and when you're led by all of these wonderful scientific um, chemicals that my wife talked about, when you're led by these things, sometimes you can't decipher a truth from a lie. Yeah. And I'm gonna keep it real. When you're driven by some of these hormones, ugly then tends to look pretty. <laughs> Don't act like y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're drunk on these emotions and these chemicals, your eyes begin to play tricks on you. And when you come down off of that high, you wipe your eyes and you be like, what in the world? This goes to show you that you cannot depend solely on your carnality or your flesh. You have to be led by the Spirit. When we forfeit the leading of the Holy Spirit, you are bound to find yourself somewhere in a ditch. And so, this is why we want you to be sober. Be vigilant. Make sure you're not drunk or desperate on these emotions and these feelings and you find yourself making decisions that do not align up with Scripture. And one thing that we have to understand is that lust has no boundaries. Some of us try to tame our lust. 
it, it is impossible to tame your lust. You cannot tame it. It's, it. it's a wild beast on its own. And so that is why we see now the enemy beginning to attack our generation much younger. This is why we see things that typically were very unacceptable 10 years ago that are being very accepted. And this is because lust has no boundaries. And so it will start off just by saying, hey, just, just a little bit of sex outside of, of marriage. And then it will start to attack your sexuality. And then, and then next, I mean, we have, there are so many perverse things that happen. And this stuff was breeded from lust. It was breeded from lust. And a lot, of, a lot of times people think that they can have these pet demons and just have, you know what, I know this is a demon, I know this isn't right, I know this is, I know this is lust, I know this is sin, I'm going to tame it and I'm not going to allow for it to spread. You don't have the ability to do that. Yeah, that's right. No. You don't have the ability to say, I'm going to just keep him over here. We're going to do what we do on the weekends, and it's not going to grow into anything more than that. You are not strong enough to tame lust. And that is the issue. A lot of people think that they have the ability to dictate where it takes you. But when you understand that lust is a beast on its own, and when the, and when the Lord finally says, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and hand you over to that, because you're so entertained by it, I'm just going to go ahead and let you, let you have it, then that's where it begins to completely consume you. It's very important that you don't turn a deaf ear to the Holy Spirit. As, I'm pretty sure all of us can relate. Have you ever been on the way to do something, not necessarily sexual, whatever, and you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit saying, don't do that. Yeah. Don't go there. Has anybody ever felt that way? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you override the voice. You find yourself in a situation. Next time, the voice of the Holy Spirit said, don't do that. Don't go there. You override it. The next time, the voice gets more and more settled. Yeah. More and more soft. You're like, wait a minute. I don't. I don't, I don't hear him telling me not. Because he's like, well, you're going to do what you want to anyway. I don't want to waste my words because I'm going to give my word to somebody who's going to heed and obey. Let's make sure that we're yielding our members to the Holy Spirit. Make sure we're yielding our hearts, our minds, our souls. This is something that we need to hear. Because if you want your blessing, first let's live pure. If you want to get everything that the Lord has promised you, it's got your blessing with your name on it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Two steps to the right and to the left. Live holy and be pure. One thing that we don't want you to do is to dance over perversion. Jesus. I don't want you to give over perversion. Because what you're doing is it's like... You're like compounding a, a trash compactor has the ability to take a whole bunch of trash and make it look little, and it keeps compounding it. Next thing you know, when you're trying to get free, when you want to be delivered, you got to dig through a whole bunch of things that's been compounded and, and compressed, and it's taking you forever to get through it. One, I said this probably last Sunday or, or the week before. I said, don't be loyal to a tomb. Don't be loyal to the place of your death. She was talking about pet demons. Sometimes your pet might turn around and bite you. The very thing you feed it, the very thing you take care of, that thing going to show its teeth and it's going to bite you. And then you're going to feel betrayed, but it was never loyal to you in the first place. It will always get what it wants out of you and be done with you. This is why we're talking about wholeness, purity, be consecrated. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, it, the God would tell the people, sanctify yourselves. Yeah. He didn't say, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to make you holy. He says, no, you need to do something to, to bring your members under correction, to make discipline. Sanctify yourself. And in your sanctification and in your uprightness. This is how we honor the Lord. We don't just honor the Lord in our giving. Yes, I'm a pastor and I would love for you to give. But you honor the Lord even better in your members, yeah. in your body. Because this is the offering we give him. We don't just give him what we have, but we give him who we are. And I, there's a scripture that tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. This is one way that you can grieve the Holy Spirit is by ignoring is by ignoring your convictions. I think one of the most dangerous places you could ever be is when you get to a point where you no longer have conviction over what you once had conviction over. Jesus. Your conviction, I mean, conviction is literally the heartbeat of the believer. It lets you know you're alive. It lets you know, you know what? The, the Holy Spirit is still here with me. Yeah. Yeah. 
What we do is sometimes we mistake conviction for condemnation and we allow it to take us out. But the Lord wants, when, when, you, when you fall, the Lord wants you to feel grief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that is what allows you to know that I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I belong to, the, I, I belong to someone. Yeah. Yeah. That's his way of saying I'm, 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 I'm not pleased. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard somebody say in the church, don't be judging me. You can't judge me. We all sin and fall short of glory. They do it just like that. Don't be judging me. That's what happens when you've been when you're delusional and drunk. You will you will think when somebody says, "Hey, bro, hey, sis, don't do that." You know, the Lord's not pleased. Oh, you're just judging me. If you are sober, you would realize that it's not judgment; it's accountability. We in here in the church, we're not here to judge you. We're here to hold you to the higher standard that the Lord knows you can live up to. And let me give some context to that scripture because it gets under my skin. Under your skin. It under because I hate it. So the Bible tells us not to judge. When they say judge not, they're talking about we are not to judge the heart and the motive of someone. As believers, once you become a believer, you say, hey, can you be my account? I have the right to judge your sin and, and your And we don't actions. judge the world. So you, don't, you, don't judge, you don't put someone in heaven or hell. I don't say, no, you wanted to do that. You wanted to fall. That, that is wrong judgment. When I say that's sin, that's not okay. You have to live different. That is, that is judgment that is going to save your life, not condemn you. That's right. But when someone says, don't, don't judge me, I say, okay, well, I'll just let Jesus do it. I mean, would you rather me judge you now? Like say, hey, that's not okay so that we can bring some correction? Or for Jesus to give you the ultimate judgment because you want it to completely do away with anybody giving you accountability. That's a dangerous place to be. That's good. Somebody say, that's good. So ain't nobody here to judge you. We're here to hold you accountable. Righteous judgment. Bringing you up to a standard. You are the blood ball believers, Christians, spirit-filled people. And if we're filled with this spirit, our lives have to come up just a little bit higher. Amen. And this is not solely a singles message. This is an everybody message. Because I'm, I'm here to tell you, I've been married for not even a year yet. It don't get easy when you get married. Let the married people say amen. amen. <laughs> Marriage is not a solution to lust. You were a lust bucket before you got married? Guess what? A ring and some papers don't don't kill us. You're gonna be a lust bucket after you get married. You gotta get your soul right. Let the whole church say amen. And so we want you to live a whole life. We want you to be pure, consecrated, sanctified. Your body is a living sacrifice to the Lord. Your eyes, your eyes, see, this is why he says, meditate on these things. Because, and he says, after you meditate on these things, you're able to judge that which is good, perfect, and acceptable will of the Lord. Yeah. When you're drunk, you can't judge anything. Yeah. And so what we want to do today, we want to pray for you on the first installment of this message. We want to pray for your soul to be made whole. At least start the process. We want to help walk you to the place of wholeness. Fractured souls. Scattered souls. You got one piece of your soul here, another piece over there, another piece here, another piece there. We want to bring you to the place of wholeness. God wants to heal you. It is God's desire that we live a life and that we can have pleasures, that we can have relationships, that we can have intimate relationships with our spouses, our husbands, and our wives. And for those of you, I, you know what? I can, I can really do a really good singles conference. I could do a really, really good single because the majority of my life I was a single man. I didn't always do it right, but I learned from my mistakes. I learned from my mistakes, I learned from error, I learned from all of that, and I had to know that in order for me to receive the gift of the gift that God has for me, I have to bring my life up to a standard of holiness and purity and righteousness. Because I want that to be the gift for my spouse. So we want to pray for you. Go ahead, baby. Lord, and I was just thinking, one thing that really makes it hard for some people to live a life of purity when they're single is because they really don't trust that the Lord is going to send their spouse. And so you start to kind of play the role of God where you believe that you are in control of your now because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Good. Good. And so many of us today need to just let loose, let, let it go. Trust in the Lord that he has, he has something better for you. Amen. 
because it's not our job to take it into our own hands. Because I know, I know when I was a single woman, that is one thing that was some of my, that was one of my biggest temptations. Lord, I don't know how long I'm going to be waiting. I don't know. I, I'm doing this right. By year five, I'm like, okay, Lord. By year six, I'm like, all right, my friends is getting married. By year nine, I was like, okay, Lord, seriously, I'm about to backslide and repent later. Like, I, I need you to come through. Don't act like nothing. I ain't never said that. <laughs> See, I'll repent after. He'll forgive me. For, for a lot of us, it's a trust issue. And if you really say, Lord, I trust that you are going to, you're going to, the Lord doesn't want to tease you. If you desire to be married, you will get married. If that is a desire. And so for a lot of us, it's just rendering that to the Lord and saying, you know what, Lord, I trust you. I'm no longer going to put this in my own hands. I'm no longer going to allow for that that thought, that mistrust that I'm going to be waiting for forever. I'm not going to allow the, the, the voice of the accuser to dictate how I live my life. But I'm going to trust you. I believe that's many of us in here.